But this is, uh, uh, my, 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 my background is in particle physics, in theoretical particle physics, and this is basically a particle physics 101, the basic stuff uh, that uh, I want to tell you about. So I don't know if you've heard about, you've probably heard about the discovery or the announcement in July of the discovery of uh, the Higgs boson. And this made the, even the headlines on the New York Times and popular uh, newspapers. And, and, but I want to give you the perspective from a particle physicist's point of view why this was special. Like in 1995, they found a tough quark, which was also a big discovery, but it didn't make uh, people um, as uh, excited or disappointed. I'll tell you why disappointed uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, but the tough quark didn't make the, the headlines like the, the X boson. There's something special about the X boson, and it's really marking uh, a, a radical shift in uh, particle physics, both theoretical and experimental. So there's really something special there. So I'll, I'll try to give you an idea why why uh, people got so excited and why people got so disappointed. Also, okay. So just a brief outline of the the talk, which is uh, uh, the plan to be impossible to follow. First, I give you a brief <coughs> historical background and introduce you to the central model of particle physics, which is, as far as we know, the most complete theory of uh, the macroscopic world that we have today. Um, I'll give you some uh, crash course on accelerator physics, how particle accelerators uh, work. Uh, I'll tell you about the detectors used um, in Geneva. You probably know the boson was discovered uh, at CERN, which is um, the Centre European de Recherche Nucléaire near Geneva in uh, Switzerland. So I'll tell you about the, uh, the, the machine, the accelerator, the detectors, and then the, the experiment itself and the results, and then tell you what people uh, expect beyond the standard model. First, why do we expect that the standard model is not the final theory, fi final fundamental theory of, of, uh, of matter? It can only be an approximation to something deeper. We're sure of that. Uh, it's based on what? No, we're sure of that. There's something beyond the standard model. What could it be? Uh, uh, that's, um, no, that's the subject of the next uh, few Nobel Prizes. And after that, if I have time, I'll tell you more in detail the Higgs mechanism, explain to you the, the Higgs mechanism. But um, by that time, it's probably going to be dark outside and you want to go home. So I'm not sure if I'll get to that. Um, people usually say that particle physics started at the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, or the century with the discovery of the electron, proton, and so on. But personally, I think really it started uh, about 40 years later, uh, earlier. Uh, with really uh, with chemistry, with Mendeleev. Because Mendeleev was looking at the elements that were known at that time, and he made this, this, this table in 1869. And you see, if, uh, so it, no, the order is usually were used to see that on, on the side, but you have hydrogen, uh, you jump to lithium, helium was not known at that time. So he was organizing things in uh, the elements that were known in terms of their mass, but also in terms of their, their chemical properties. So he was trying to understand, you know, what all, you know, there was all those elements, many, many of them, but there was some pattern there. And looking at the chemical properties, the masses, he even postulated the existence of new elements that were not known uh, when he made that, that, that table. Now we know um, we're up to 118 now, but for example, um, Mendeleev uh, postulated the existence of element 21, scandium, before it was discovered. Um, also, uh, uh, gallium here, uh, germanium, te technetium, technetium here was also pre predicted by Mendeleev. So just the part of the symmetry of the organization of things, how things fell, and he saw that there were gaps in properties that he expected there were new elements that would fill those gaps. Because when he was making a stable, there seemed to be gaps when you were looking at the order in which the mass was increased, increasing, it was a, a, a different increase, and then there was a gap, and then you jump to another element. So we predicted those elements, and uh, they were discovered. Unfortunately, he never got the Nobel Prize, even though he died after the Nobel Prize uh, started. He died in 1907, which is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of the big misses of, uh, of Nobel Prize uh, uh, awards, to not give one to Mendeleev. Um, here you see <coughs> a monument to Mendeleev in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, in Russia, which is, I uh, uh, can tell you, this is the most beautiful city I've ever visited. 
Okay, so I want to I want to tell you about that because there's a paradigm there that will be repeated a couple of times throughout the history of particle physics. You see, you look at that. There's 180 elements, so a lot, and they uh, but their properties. No, now no, there's the way they're they're organized here, and you have the metallized here, actinus here. Uh, it's related to their, their, their physical properties. So there's a pattern in mass, but there's also a pattern in properties. Like you have, you know, the, the, those gases are, are, are um, inert. They, they, they don't react very well. Now we understand that in terms of filling these shells, of electron shells. So there was a lot of elements, and when you look at something like that, when you have a lot of stuff, and there's some pattern that you see a symmetry, you, you think there must be some underlying concept or symmetry or something that should explain things in central words and say, okay, you have all those 118 elements and they have those properties. Why do they, uh, why are they organized like that? Why do you see this clear, clear, clear pattern? Nobody knows. We expect there's something deeper. And sure enough, what is deeper is the fact that now uh, we realize that actually those, all those elements are made of only three particles. So instead of having 118 different things, you have only three. And the only difference between uh, <clears throat> different elements is the number of, so you have, you have, you have the uh, electron cloud here, which is a typical size, size of about uh, one angstrom or a few angstrom. An angstrom. One angstrom is 10 to minus 10 meters, so it's 0.1 nanometer. So this is the typical size of an atom. Uh, but the nucleus here is much, much smaller. It's 100,000 uh, 100, times smaller than, than the typical size of the atom. It's one, one Fermi, that's a unit of, uh, it's 10 minus 15 meters. And inside the nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. Okay? So suddenly you go from 118 things, well, they were not all known back, you know, when they, those were discovered, but you have 118 things, you go down to only three. And not only that, but you understand the chemical properties. You understand that in terms of filling the shell, the electron shell, you have different reactivity and so on. So there's a clear, you know, it's really nice, right? You go from this 118 things, and then you go down to three, and you understand everything in terms of something much central. So this is the driving um, paradigm in particle physics. When you see a lot of different things, and there's some pattern, you try to find something central that could unify concepts, and you can write everything in terms of fewer number of particles. Okay, so. 1897 discovery of electron, proton is 1917, neutron 1932. Great, that's it. We're finished. <laughs> we should be done. That's you no, know, we can be done with particle physics. Then there's there's nothing else left. 1932, the positron is discovered. Now that's a, a bit uh, special. The positron is the anti-particle associated with electrons. It's, it's an anti-electron. So it's basically an electron with a positive charge. Now, positron um, was predicted before it was discovered by uh, Dirac. And uh, now we know that when you, um, you marry quantum mechanics with uh, relativity, you have to necessarily have anti particle antimatter. And that's something that was predicted on, on paper by Dirac before it was discovered. Okay, so that's not so bad so far. You say, okay, yeah, every time you have a particle, you must have its anti particle somewhere in nature. You can create it at least. That's okay. Then, bad news, something else. A muon. Uh, um, it's pronounced muon, not muon, because there's a famous uh, t-shirt, physics t-shirt where it says, uh, I found a muon, and you have a drawing of a cow on the, on the, on the picture. <laughs> but the muon was uh, in 1936. Um, Radley, who was a Nobel Prize winner, said at that point, his reaction was to say, but who ordered that thing? <laughs> said, we didn't need that. We're happy with what we were done. We thought we thought were done. A muon is basically, uh, it's at the same charge as an electron. It's about, uh, about 200 uh, times more, more heavy. It's like a heavy electron. In 1947, the pion is discovered. Now, the pion was also predicted on, uh, uh, on paper by a physicist, a Japanese physicist, uh, Yukawa, uh, while uh, before. And uh, I won't get into that. But the pion was a uh, new part. Then, okay, the neutrinos, which were, again, the neutrino was predicted by Pauli before it was discovered. It's amazing to see how 
just based on, 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 on theory. Uh, well, uh, it's a bit different for, for the, uh, the positron here. This right when you predict the positron, it was purely, purely mathematical. He just wrote a, 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 an equation, married that with, with uh, married, married uh, relativity with quantum mechanics, and just from mathematics, he predicted the antimatter. So Dirac was, was an amazing, um, was really a, almost a pure mathematician, but he was, was, uh, was amazing. But the, the, the pion and the, uh, well, the pion and the neutrino were predicted because of problems with some experiments before. So a pion was postulated by Yukawa, and the neutrino was postulated by Pauli to explain some discrepancy in some nuclear beta decay. But anyway, they had that. Then in the 40s and 50s, then people kept discovering almost once a week there was a new particle to be discovered. K on, uh, C particles, uh, and then it kept going on and on and on. To the point that, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's Oppenheimer or someone famous said that uh, at what point in 1958, uh, someone said uh, this year the Nobel Prize should be given to an experimental physicist who did not discover a particle. <laughs> <laughs> but there were so many of them. So then it became what we call the zoo of particles. There were tons of them. Now we're back to, at the deeper level, we're back to what Mendeleev was facing. We have those tons of particles. There's some pattern among them. Um, but we, then we expect that they're not all fundamental particles. There might be something deeper. And that led uh, Murray Gellman and Newman, uh, who's a, an Israeli uh, physicist, in 1962, to uh, connect the patterns of particle, those particles that were discovered. OK, I, I, I have to make a distinction. There is a particles that are called hadrons. Uh, they're distinct from what we call lepons. I don't want to get into a, there's a lot of uh, terminology. Um, but uh, the hadrons now are, are not considered to be fundamental, but the leptons are. So um, hadrons include, I'll tell you why in a minute, but the pion is an hadron. Muon is not. Positron is not. Neutron protons are hadrons. And the electron is not. But I'll, get, I'll tell you why in a few minutes. So the hadrons are a bit different. Anyway, they, those two uh, guys use uh, um, mathematical math. math uh, to be more precise, group theory, and to be more precise, they use the group SU3, which is, stands for Special Unitary uh, of uh, Degree 4. Well, I don't want to get into that, but it's just a mathematical uh, concept to organize symmetry. Okay, this is basically group theory is a branch of, of mathematics that, uh, that studies the symmetry between different uh, objects. And using that, uh, Gellman actually uh, predicted a new theory, a new particle. So let me just um, just give you an idea where that comes from. But it will look a bit like um, okay. So you can make this this diagram where you have those are all different. Delta is is uh, is one of those particles that means discovered. There's, there's several deltas here. Okay, so uh, you use the same symbol here, but they have um, they're different. Like delta one, delta two, three, four. Sigma 1, 2, 3, uh, C1, C2. Now, they organize a, a plot, and in the vertical direction, there's a mass. Uh, actually, it goes, it increases down, down, downwards. It's a bit confusing. So those, all those four here have about the same mass. Those here have about the same mass, same mass, same. Okay. Let me wait for that one. Okay. Ignore that one for now. So those have the same mass. The, change, the difference of mass between those four and those three is about the same as the difference of mass between those three and those, those two. Okay, so the increase of mass is about the same. And uh, there is this uh, pattern here. All those particles here are, has a, have a charge of minus one. Those are neutral, one, and two. And here they have what, uh, another quantum number called the strangeness. strangeness. I'll tell you what it's related to in a minute. Anyway, there's this really uh, neat way of organizing particles in terms of their properties and their mass. This had never been seen. So when Gellman and um, Gellman wrote this, this theory at first, it was this thing was missing. And he predicted that there should be a particle with those quantum numbers that should be found in the in, in experiment. And not only that, he used the difference of mass here to predict the mass of this omega particle, called the omega mi minus now, because it has a charge of minus one. He said, we should find a particle of, with a charge minus one, 
treasures of minus 3 at a mass of 1,600, uh, 1680 MeV. I'll get back to the news in a minute, but that's, uh, that's a mass, 1680. They did the experiment, they found particles with the, those properties at a mass of 1686 MeV. It was dead on. He had predicted that the particle before it was discovered. So he was repeating what Mendeleev had done before, but now with those those atoms. Okay. Now, why why do you have this SQ3 symmetry? It was later realized that it was because all those hadrons are actually made of quarks. So now, instead of having dozens and dozens of hadrons, well, we have them, but now we understand that them has been all made of quarks. Okay, like Mendeleev, when we realized that the uh, elements that uh, all the elements are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. We know now that atoms are made of 